All right, well, let's go ahead and get started. Um, howdy and welcome everybody to our fourth uh, climate sensitivity and cloud feedback uh, virtual symposium. Uh, my name is Andy Dessler, one of the organizers, along with Christy Prosescu, who will be talking in a second. Um, and um, just a few ground rules. Um, we're going to have um, three AGU style talks, 12 minutes. Uh, Christy will be calling out the time speakers and he'll give you a two minute warning or some warning, two or three minutes. Um, uh, uh, for the uh, viewers, you should be muted. And if I have this set correctly, never certain, uh, you will be unable to unmute yourself. Uh, so if you have questions, type them into the chat at any time. And then at the end of the talk, we'll read them out. Uh, if you prefer to ask a question live, you know, too long to type in, uh, raise your hand and you can do that if you go to the participants window and then we can unmute you and you can ask the question. And then um, we will have a general uh, Q&A for a few minutes, like five minutes after the last talk um, for people whose questions didn't get answered or if you have a general question for all the speakers. Um, and lastly, um, you know, we're always looking for uh, interesting and uh, uh, it, people that maybe we wouldn't think of, you know, we all, uh, it's, it's hard to come up with people that you don't necessarily uh, think of by definition. So if you want to give a talk, email me or Christy. We're always, again, we're always looking for uh, people who otherwise wouldn't get invitations. Um, and so with that, I will turn it over to Christy to uh, introduce the start introducing the speakers. Thanks, Andy. Um, I think we're actually on our fifth, uh, on our fifth uh, colloquium right now. Oh, is it number five? Virtual right. symposium. Yeah. They all run together. Flies. At point. Okay. So, um, yes, I will give you a warning about 10 minutes into uh, your talk that you should wrap it up in about two minutes. So our first speaker is Angie Pendergrass. She has just started a faculty position at Cornell, and I believe she's uh, talking to us from Ithaca. Uh, take it away, Angie. I think you're muted. Hey, can you hear me now? Yes. Oh, perfect. Now let's get the slides going. Okay. Uh, how, why is this so hard? Can you see my slides? Yes, we can see your slides. Yeah, they, they look great. Perfect. Okay. Thank you for having me. I'm really excited to be able to tell you this story today. Um, it's been a long time in the making, and you'll see what I mean by that. Um, as Christy mentioned, I am calling in from Ithaca, where I am in quarantine. I uh, just arrived last week. Um, the work that I'm going to tell you about today, though, is something that I did when I was still at NCAR full-time, and still at NCAR part-time, um, and actually, I wrote it up while I was an academic guest at ETH Zurich last year, and that's relevant because you'll see. Um, while I was doing this, I was funded by the Department of Energy, which, for which I'm extremely appreciative and grateful. Um, I had a lot of fun working with the Catalyst team, and I'm still having fun working with the Catalyst team. Okay, so I'm going to start. If I can advance my slides, I would like to start at the beginning. Um, we all need a fresh start, I think, uh, at least those of us in the US. Um, so first there was the universe. Um, this is a webinar on equilibrium climate sensitivity. So I'm gonna assume a really high level of knowledge um, of the top of atmosphere energy budget and also of ECS, just in the interest of time. Um, so. There's a planet, there's space. This is a picture from the Discover satellite, which I think is pretty awesome. Um, now I'm gonna tell you about precipitation. And so for precipitation, we have to go beyond just the top of atmosphere energy imbalance. Um, and we have to talk about the atmosphere and the surface. So those fluxes at the interface between the atmosphere and the surface. So um, we're gonna break this down here. So. Um, the story actually begins um, in about between 2002 and 2006. Um, so 
there are a couple of papers that came out around that time kind of emphasizing the um, atmospheric energy or surface energy perspective um, on changes in precipitation. So um, one of those was Allen and Ingram that came out in 2002. So that's a, a review paper. And it was actually touching on um, some work that started from about 1970. And there was a, a really excellent paper in 1987 by Mitchell um, that kind of laid out a lot of what we still talk about today. Um, in 2006, there was a paper by Isaac Held and Brian Soden in the Journal of Climate um, that really got me started on this because I started, I was working with Brian Soden at the time um, that that came out. Um, I was an undergrad then. So um, the big picture of uh, the role of precipitation in Earth's energy budget is that um, when you have evaporation of water from the surface, um, that cools the surface. That water is transported into the atmosphere and when it condenses again into a cloud, um, it releases that latent heat into the atmosphere. The water falls back to the surface, completing a cycle of the water budget, um, and that heat is left behind. So the, cycle, the water cycle um, transfers energy from the surface to the atmosphere. So um, in equilibrium, in the global mean, uh, the evaporation and precipitation are in balance, and they are, um, they're balanced by these other terms of either the surface or atmospheric energy budget. They're diagnostic, and so you can look at either, um, and they should, should both be in balance in equilibrium. And so the other terms of that budget are the sensible heat flux. Can you see my pointer here? Uh, I'm going to yeah, see you can yeah, see yes. my pointer. You can see it. Thanks. Um, so the sensible heat flux, um, shortwave radiation which is coming from the sun and some of it is getting reflected back to space, some of it is making down to the surface. Um, and then long wave emission from the atmosphere to space, uh, from the atmosphere to the surface, from the surface to the atmosphere, and then some of that escapes back up to space. So those all have to be in balance. Going through this quickly. Hopefully you've seen it a little bit before. Now, um, in response to warming, um, we get adjustments of a lot of these different fluxes. And so um, precipitation on average increases in the global mean, sensible heat flux decreases, um, and then there are changes in the long wave emission and the short wave emission. Okay, so after working on this as an undergrad, I kind of took a break for a little while and I came back to it as a PhD student. Um, and so when I was a PhD student, one of the things that I was trying to understand um, was what controls the spread across the CMIT model in the global mean precipitation. And by control, I mean which aspects of the global energy balance um, kind, of, kind of are in balance with that. Um, and so um, I did a lot of thinking about that. And one of the things that came out of it is, um, is that the shortwave cloud radiative effect um, turns out to not be such a big factor. Because, um, that's because there isn't really very much shortwave radiation absorbed by clouds um, within the atmospheric column, if you look at, at it from the atmospheric perspective. And so um, if you've been hanging around this webinar for a little while, you've heard people like um, the shortwave cloud radiative effects and how important they are for controlling climate sensitivity. And so um, if you think about precipitation change from the atmosphere perspective, you can kind of just set that aside. Um, and so uh, that, that notion kind of stuck with me. Okay, so that was in about 2013, 2014. Um, came along people like Dagmar Flashner, who's a PhD student with Torsten Maurison um, at MPI in Hamburg. Um, and she um, carefully wrote some definitions of the hydrologic sensitivity which is the change in global mean to kind of reconcile some of the literature that was laying around her definition here. Um, now, I know a lot of you have spent a lot of time thinking about Gregory regression. And so this definition is something uh, really closely analogous to that. Um, so the, the, um, with the top, with the top of atmosphere energy imbalance, when we're actually doing Gregory regression, you have an intercept at zero and that um, increases as you go to warmer and warmer temperatures. Precipitation is a little bit different because the direct response of precipitation to greenhouse gas warming is a decrease. Um, but then you get this really consistent increase from there um, with warming. And in equilibrium or after 150 years um, of the abrupt four times CO2 response, which is what we're going to focus on, um, 
we see overall this increase in precipitation. And so today I just want to focus on the slope of this line here. So that's this hydrologic sensitivity parameter as Dagmar defined it. Okay, so this stuff is all floating around. Um, and I became a project scientist at NCAR. And you know, this is in the before time, so I had an office, and in the office next to me was Ben Sanderson, this guy here. And so he's done a lot of thinking about, uh, about climate sensitivity, and he's also a really fun person to talk to. And so um, we chatted about this quite, quite a bit. Um, you know, how could climate sensitivity be related to the hydrologic sensitivity? We doodled a lot on whiteboards, and I took a bunch of notes. So I'm not going to go through them in detail here, but um, we made a lot of assumptions. And we got to this point where we, uh, after you know, reading uh, one of Mark Linkus' papers, figured that probably the hydrologic sensitivity should be related to climate sensitivity via some cloud mechanism. But then we went and pulled up the CMS5 data, and lo and behold, this correlation is, is 0.2. And so there's about 25 models here, so that's not significantly different from zero. And so that left us a little bit puzzled, and it, it left us with this question of why are ECS and hydrologic sensitivity not related? We came up with a list of possible things. These are my actual notes from uh, that time, by the way. I scanned them uh, and found them yesterday. But then, you know, we both got distracted. Other things came up and it's kind of faded away. Okay. Lo and behold, Masahiro Watanabe, he picks this back up. Um, and he, he focused the conversation for us, which is, which is great. So um, this paper of his came out in, in 2018. Um, and what he did was he pointed out that there's this link uh, via low cloud. And so um, what this is, uh, here, what he's showing um, is on the X axis here, the surface long wave cloud rating of effect sensitivity to warming. And so that's a component of the surface energy budget. That should be related uh, to the hydrologic sensitivity. And then on the Y axis here, he's doing the top of the atmosphere shortwave cloud rated of effect um, feed parameter. Um, and these are pretty strongly correlated in CMIP5. Their correlation is minus 0.79. He also did some single model experiments, um, kind of fleshing this out and looked at the perturbed parameter single model ensemble um, and found this process level linkage, which is pretty convincing, I think. And so um, just to walk you through a little bit of what that mechanism is, um, the idea here is that um, across climate models, there's a relatively large variation in the, uh, frac the cloud amount, the cloud fraction change in response to warming. And so the models that have a larger amount decrease um, have a larger reduction in uh, shortwave reflection to space at the top of the atmosphere. And so they have higher equilibrium climate sensitivity. Um, now, what this larger amount decrease would mean for hydrologic sensitivity is, is that you have reduced long wave emission from the atmosphere to the surface by these clouds. And so that should actually give you a lower hydrologic sensitivity. And so this is a pathway where you could have a connection between ECS and hydrologic sensitivity. Uh, but as we had seen, this correlation is 0.2. And so um, he, he found this uh, correlation that's strong in the single model experiments, but it doesn't really translate to theme of five. Um, and so that left us with some confusion. And so um, when the theme of six simulations came out, now you've probably heard um, a fair amount about, um, about emergent constraints and how we can use new uh, CMIP generations as a kind of out of, out of sample test. We know that the models aren't really totally independent, but it's kind of the best that we're gonna do in terms of getting an independent, um, independent data set. And so I wanted to revisit this and ask, do the low clouds link ECS to hydrologic sensitivity in CMIP 6? Um, so I pulled up some minutes. CMIP six simulations. Thank you. I pulled up some CMIP six simulations with a lot of help from ORS. These are fairly standard approaches. Um, just looking at the abrupt four times CO two simulations. So I'm going to jump right in. Um, and so the idea here is is that um, Mansa's paper showed that there was a process level mechanism, and he showed um, that this global level response 
we claimed it existed, but it was kind of a little bit weak. So um, when we pick this back up in CMIP 6, we see that this process level uh, connection is still there. Um, the, uh, the relationship between ECS and hydrologic sensitivity themselves is still kind of weak. It's, now it's 0.15, so it's a little bit weaker than it was. And so, um, but I think what we need to do is really connect these up. Um, how, and take a look at how um, ECS is connected to the uh, top of atmosphere shortwave uh, effects and how hydrologic sensitivity is connected to the surface effects, right? So um, make these connections from the process level mechanisms to the global level responses. So now um, all of you have already heard Mark Winka tell us about the connection between shortwave cloud radiative effects and ECS and CMIP 6, we know that that's still a strong relationship. So um, let's have a look at the response, the relationship between hydrologic sensitivity and surface long wave cloud radiative effect. I've obviously speeded up because I had more to say than 12 minutes really allowed. Um, and so we can see that this is actually quite a weak relationship. So, um, so X and Y axes here have the same magnitude of spread. So we can see that the correlation is pretty low. It's definitely not significant. And we can also see that um, the variation in the hydrologic sensitivity, the magnitude of the variation, is quite a lot bigger in terms of watts per meter squared per Kelvin than the changes in the surface long wave cloud rate of effect sensitivity are. So that relationship is kind of missing. Really quickly, um, we can dive in to the atmosphere and surface energy components and, 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 and see where those relationships are, are coming from and going. Um, so just looking at the whole atmosphere column energy budget in these abrupt four time CO2 simulations, there's a really strong relationship with the total atmospheric energy budget. A slightly less strong relationship with the surface energy budget, which is because you have some uh, top of atmosphere energy imbalance that's reflected in the, uh, the ocean heat con uh, ocean heat uptake. Um, when we put in the, the sensible heat flux, the sensible heat flux has a really small magnitude variation compared to the radiative fluxes in the surface and the atmosphere. So if we just dive further into this atmospheric radiative flux here, which um, has a, a pretty strong correlation, we can break that. So that's here now, and then we can break that down into its long wave, short wave components in the clear sky and the cloud radiative effects. We can see that the short wave cloud radiative effect is real small, as we expected. Um, but all of these other correlations are significant. The largest one is between the atmospheric column radiative fluxes, um, and, uh, atmospheric column long wave cloud radiative effect sensitivity. We can even break that down a little bit further into its surface and top of atmosphere effect. So the surface one here, that was our linkage in the previous plot before. Um, and we can actually see that a lot of, in CMIP 6, a lot of this atmosphere column long wave cloud radiative effect sensitivity is driven by the top of atmosphere instead of the surface. And so that's one way, it's not satisfying, I think, um, of seeing where these relationships went. Um, now, that's a little bit different than in CMIP 5. Um, in CMIP 5, this relationship between the atmosphere column and the hydrologic sensitivity uh, was smaller than the surface relationship, um, I think. And then um, the other thing that it's sensitive to is the time scale. Because if you look at the top of atmosphere fluxes, um, as we know from thinking about the um, equilibrium climate sensitivity, there's a time scale dependence. If you drop the first 20 years uh, and, and isolate that fast response, um, it looks a little bit different. So um, overall, we're kind of missing that uh, linkage between the process level mechanism and the global response for the hydrologic sensitivity. And so I think that's why there's perhaps not actually a relationship between hydrologic sensitivity and ECS in the CMIP simulation. Um, so with that, I will conclude. Um, I think that low clouds don't actually link ECS and hydrologic sensitivity, despite Maza's uh, assertions previously, despite that a process level link is pregnant, uh, present. And the, um, the reason that they're correlated um, is because the surface low cloud radiative effect is just not an important factor for hydrologic sensitivity. If I said all of that too fast, you can go read about it. It's already published. Um, and this is actually just one third of a DRL paper. And of course, you're also welcome to email me and tweet at me, though I don't promise to tweet back quickly. Thanks. 
Thanks, Angie. Um, we got time for, for maybe one question right now, and we can come back to this at the discussion at the end. Uh, Kerry has a question. At high enough temperature, the net IR flux at a sea surface becomes small, and evaporation is balanced mostly by absorbed solar. Any further increase in greenhouse gas concentration cannot further elevate evaporation, but temperature continues to go up. In that limit, there is no relationship between ECS and evaporation. Uh, yeah, I, I agree. Um, I mean, so one place that you can see this is in, um, Paula Gorman has done some simple model experiments um, where you can see the saturation of hydrologic sensitivity as it gets to really high temperatures. Um, so Monsa's paper and kind of these, these um, abrupt four times CO2 experiments are in a, a regime that's kind of linear around today, kind of linear. Um, so you're not getting to this kind of saturation point. And actually this, um, this low cloud effect, um, Monsa paper goes into it in more detail, but um, it, it's kind of hinging a lot on the uh, latitudinal gradient of the uh, low cloud radiative effect. And so it's important that you're not already in this regime where things are saturated. Um, yeah, but th that's a good point. Things start to change as you get to much, uh, much warmer climate, for sure. Okay. Thank you. Um, okay, in the interest of time, we should be moving on. So we might get back to this at the end. People can stick around after the hour is over. So our next, uh, our next speaker is uh, Nader who is busy typing in the chat right now. Uh, Nader is a physical scientist um, at um, GFDL, and um, he's going to talk to us about how high the sky. Uh, no, OK. Can you hear me now? Yes. OK, great. Uh, let me go. screen here. Okay, can everyone see that all right? Yes, yeah, that's great. Great, well thanks for having me. Yes, so indeed, how high is the sky? Uh, and this will tie in nicely to um, some of what Angie was saying about the atmospheric constraint um, and the atmospheric energy budget. Um, so, uh, and this is joint work uh, with, with Stefan Pistoller, um, who advised me during my postdoc. Uh, and this is documented in a paper that came out uh, earlier this year. Has. So um, the troposphere, uh, as we know, it's the, it's the layer of the atmosphere that's, um, that experiences a surface-driven overturning. Um, and that overturning is what we experience as weather. And it turns out that there's a very tight link, uh, as Angie was explaining, between weather and, and radiative cooling, right? Whenever you have convection, um, it turns out that the uh, Convection will put you on a on an adiabatic temperature profile, which turns out uh, must give you some radiative cooling. And then, of course, that that radiative cooling, uh, depicted here um, as a vertical profile on the left, has to balance the convective heating. Um, and so, so radiative cooling and convective are really two sides of the same coin. You can't have one without the other. And if we um, and this radiative cooling profile has some interesting features. It's sort of uniform throughout much of the troposphere. I hope you guys can see my cursor here. And then it has this kink up here uh, in the upper atmosphere. Uh, and this has been seen to coincide um, with cloud tops. Furthermore, uh, these cloud tops seem to occur at a fixed temperature, the fixed anvil temperature, which in the tropics is something like roughly 220 Kelvin. And this temperature is independent of climate. And so if I run some uh, climate change experiments, uh, in this case, cloud resolving models run an RCE. Um, if I plot the cloud fraction profiles in temperature coordinates, using temperature as my vertical coordinate here, um, you see that these multiple experiments um, all overlap and, and their cloud fraction peaks all occur at a temperature of roughly 220, independent of the surface temperature. And that has implications uh, for climate change and climate feedbacks, right? Because what it means is that if that 220 isotherm is staying fixed, the SSTs are increasing, then this cloud fraction profile is um, ascending as the SST increases. And so the troposphere is deepening as a function um, of this, uh, 
uh, of the troposphere reaching up to a, to a fixed isotherm. Uh, and this has consequences for lots of things, in particular high cloud feedbacks, um, as worked out by Mark Zelinka and Dennis Hartman and others. All right. Um, so we're interested in, uh, so, so all of, everything I was discussing seems to, um, seems to hinge on this radiative cooling profile and in particular its shape here and this kink uh, up in the upper troposphere. And um, a mystery that sort of, um, that's puzzled me uh, since it was a graduate student is, all right, well, it seems intuitive that, um, you know, if this rate of cooling is driven by water vapor and water vapor is constrained by clausius clapeyron its concentrations are constrained, um, then maybe it's not so, so much of a surprise um, that this kink occurs at a constant temperature. But why is it 220 Kelvin? What sets that number? The literature um, attributes this to a declining water vapor em emissivity because as you go higher up in the atmosphere, it gets colder, water vapor becomes more scarce, and you'd think that rate of cooling has to decline. But why 220 Kelvin? Clausius clapeyron itself is just an exponential, it's scale invariance, right? So it by itself cannot pick out 220 Kelvin as a special number. Um, so this is a question that um, has sort of uh, haunted me over the years. Uh, and it's the one we're gonna try and answer uh, somewhat today. All right. Um, so to answer this, I think we'll, uh, we're going to try and simplify the problem. So this heating profile that I just showed you, so this is uh, Kelvins per day as a function of pressure. This is taken, um, this is a clear sky uh, heating rate profile. Uh, everything in this talk is going to be clear sky. Um, and, uh, and this is taken from ECMWF reanalysis. It's a global mean, right? Um, and so one thing we want to do is see whether or not we can reproduce this in a model that's a little bit lower. And so we consider a, a, one, a single column uh, with very simplified atmospheric parameters. And then we take that uh, simplified uh, single atmospheric column and run it through line by line radiation code uh, to get radiative cooling and radiative fluxes. And when you do that, you actually get spectrally resolved radiative cooling. And that, that looks like this. Um, and uh, such a plot may not be so familiar um, and so what's shown here is, so the y-axis is pressure again, but the, uh, the x-axis is wave number in inverse centimeters. Um, and which, uh, and the colors are radiative, are spectrally resolved radiative heating in kelvins per day per inverse centimeter per spectral interval. And what you see here is this band of radiative cooling um, that's sort of diagonal in this K, in this wave number pressure space. So that looks kind of mysterious. I know that when I first saw this as a graduate student, I was pretty puzzled as to what set that structure. And that's one of the things we're gonna try and understand in this talk. Uh, but the, for the purposes of this slide, um, if I take a spectral, uh, a spectral integral uh, of the right-hand plot, then I just get a profile of radiative heating and that's, in the, that's uh, given by the dashed line uh, on the left. And you see that it's a very good match to the global mean from the reanalysis. And so what that means is that I can um, reduce this problem of understanding the kink to just working with a single column. And if I can understand the single column, then it looks like maybe I've understood something about the, about the global. All right, so how do we understand that, that band of cooling? That's gonna be important. So we'll start with the absorption spectrum of water vapor. So I'm plotting here on a log axis, the uh, mass absorption coefficient in meters squared per kilogram, again, versus wave number. And remember, this is just telling you the effective size of a water vapor molecule from the point of view of an infrared photon. And so with these low wave numbers here, the absorption coefficient is high, so your water vapor molecule looks large. And down here, um, uh, uh, at around 1,000 inverse centimeters, uh, this is uh, in what's today the so-called wide water vapor window, where water vapor molecules look very small to infrared photons and, um, and radiation can escape out to space. And this is all output from the line by line code, by the way, from the single column model. Then I can plot the optical depth. And just as a quick reminder, the optical depth is just an integral of the mass absorption coefficient times the, uh, your absorber mass. Uh, you take the product of these things, you get something dimensionless, and you can think of it as uh, the effective cross-sectional area of absorbers above you um, divided by the actual area of your column. So it's, it's a ratio of areas. And so I plotted the log of the optical depth here. You can see there's quite a range uh, if you look at the color bar. And then um, this uh, dotted line here 
uh, is a tau equals one contours. And hopefully you remember from your textbooks that you expect at any given frequency, you expect the radiative cooling and the emission to space to maximize where tau equals one. That's sort of your sweet spot uh, for emission. Uh, and so you can see that this tau equals one contour um, has the same shape as the absorption spectrum as it should because tau is proportional to kappa. So these, these guys should have the same shape. And so once, uh, once you feel okay about this, then it's not too hard to understand where this, uh, the shape of this radiative cooling, spectrally resolved radiative cooling comes from. This band is just the radiative cooling concentrated around the tau equals one emission levels. But then you'll say, well, why don't I see a band of cooling over here uh, on the right-hand side of the plot? If you squint carefully, you can see it, but it turns out that the Planck function is quite weak at these high wave numbers. And so cooling out here is suppressed. And so now if we turn back to our heating rate profile, we can understand a couple of things. We can understand why the cooling is relatively uniform throughout much of the troposphere. And that's because different wave numbers are cooling at different heights. So sort of the baton is being passed from wave number to wave number as I ascend in height. And you get a relatively uniform cooling because there's a relatively um, constant sort of range of wave numbers at, e at each height that are emitting to space until you get up here uh, to the upper troposphere and it looks like there aren't really many wave numbers emitting to space. And if I go all the way over back here to the absorption spectrum, you can see that it looked like there's kind of a, a, a sort of a maximum value absorption spectrum. And that's why you get this maximum height for these tau equals one emission levels. And so it seems like there's just not uh, wave numbers that absorb strongly enough to emit from much higher up. However, the output that I'm showing you here um, is actually, even though it looks spiky and noisy, it's already coarse grained. And if I showed you the raw output, then the wiggles in the output would take up, they would they'd be a space filling, it'd be a space filling curve. Um, and it would, uh, it would fill up the, uh, these entire panels. So to get a better feel for this and to find out whether you can really get a kink from the absorption spectrum. So here's the absorption spectrum again, it's the same plot that I'd shown you in the upper left before. Um, let's take the raw data and make a PDF out of it. Show the, the, dense, the, the distribution of absorption coefficients over the spectrum. And I'm only doing this over this left hand um, part of the spectrum um, lower than 1000 inverse centimeters of so-called rotational band. And so now I'm plotting, uh, the density, the density distribution of absorption coefficients, same y-axis is on the left, but the x-axis is now the p-density. And so there isn't a sharp cutoff above which there just aren't absorption coefficients, but there is a sort of steep decline. And so there's, you, can, you could say that there's a kink in this PDF, and I've plotted it this way with the density on the, uh, the x-axis instead of the y-axis on purpose so that it looks like a kink, so that it's reminiscent of the kink in the radiative profile. Um, because indeed, I think there's a close connection there. And um, so you can ask yourself what the maximum um, of this PDF is. I'm calling that kappa kink. And it's a value of about 40 um, meters squared per kilogram. And you'll notice that this is pretty close to this, uh, you know, this is the coarse grained output that I'm showing you here. And this kappa kink is close to the, you know, what looks like a max from the coarse grained absorption coefficient. So what this seems to suggest is that the H2O absorption spectrum kind of maxes out around a particular value. And yes, there are some wave numbers that, can, that are more strongly absorbing than this, that can emit and absorb from the stratosphere. And indeed, we know that stratosphere water vapor is, thank you, uh, is radiatively active. Um, and Andy Dust and others have done that. But there's relatively few wave numbers that can do that. Um, so when I was thinking about this last night, it sort of reminded me of Spinal Tap. I don't know how many people have seen this movie. Um, but uh, I think once you get up to this value of coefficient, um, you sort of, you've turned your, uh, your water absorption up to 11. And, uh, and it's hard to crank it up any further because if you want more, you know, higher absorption, there's just very few wave numbers that can do that. Um, okay, so that's kind of a qualitative story. But can we make it quantitative? And can we somehow connect this, uh, this kappa kink value to this 220 Kelvin uh, anvil picture um, that's so well known? So to do that, we're gonna need a, a simple model that isolates this and see if it can um, and make this connection. But we've seen that the, um, the water vapor spectrum is the key role. So this can't be a gray model, as tempting as that might be. And when I first started working on this problem years ago, you know, I started with gray models and just couldn't get anywhere. Um, 
So instead, we're going to develop a simple spectral model, an SSM, for radiative cooling. So here's the line-by-line -line output that you've already seen. And then what we did is we just wrote down analytical expressions that are approximate, but that kind of capture this behavior. And in particular, I'm fitting this, um, these absorption, uh, this absorption spectrum with piecewise exponentials. These look like straight lines. Remember that this uh, y-axis here is logarithmic. So these are actually, you know, look roughly exponential. And if I do that, then I get this. And the point is just to show you that not capturing any of the fine scale spectroscopic noise, but we are capturing the gross feature of pretty much everything of the absorption spectrum, of the optical depth. And here again in the dashed lines are these tau equals one contours, as well as the radiative cooling. Um, and in particular, I want to focus on our analytical formula for the optical depth. Uh, it might look intimidating, but it's fairly easy to interpret. It's just the absorption coefficient times the pressure broadening factor, which is sort of second order, and you can ignore if you're sure what that is. And then this here is just the water vapor path. And so it's a constant dimensions of water vapor that's made up of the lapse rate and relative humidity and a few other numbers, times this clausius clapeyron exponential factor. So if I come back to this original question of where does 220 Kelvin come from, I now have a model that I can to try and answer this. And so I just take my expression for optical depth, reproduced again here, set it equal to one, and because that gives me my emission height. And the absorption coefficient that I put in here is this the kink, right? Because if there's some connection between this kink and the absorption coefficient distribution and, um, and the radiative cooling profile that gives you your fixed ambient temperatures, it must be within this equation. And you can, it turns out you can solve this equation analytically. You have to write P in terms of T, and then you need to use the Lambert W function. And it's a little bit messy, and I showed to you here just for concreteness that so you see that there is a formula. You, know, you get some sort of uh, constant with dimensions of temperature. The point is, is that there's something that you can write down and then just plug in numbers. When you plug in numbers, what do you get? You get 214 Kelvin, so right in the park. So that gives us some confidence that this connection we're drawing between the distribution of absorption coefficients and the fixed anvil temperature. Um, uh, it gives us some confidence in this relationship. Furthermore, if I look up here, you know, the thing that puzzled me um, so much as a graduate student was how can this exponential give you 220 Kelvin? Well, it can't by itself. But if you, if you combine it with this kappa kink, uh, if you combine it with some information about water vapor spectroscopy, then these two quantities uh, combined with other atmospheric parameters do give you the kink temperature. So just to summarize, um, we, uh, we sought the origin of the fixed anvil temperature. We, um, we looked into some detail into the spectral radiation and found out that the water vapor absorption coefficients seem to max out at some particular value. And then we built a simple spectral model that connected um, this kind of max value of H2O absorption coefficients to this king temperature of 220 K. And uh, that's all I have. Uh, and again, this is the reference. Um, and for your attention. Thanks, Nara. That was a fascinating talk. Uh, I really enjoyed it. So if you have any questions, um, either type them in the chat or uh, use the raise hand function from the participants list, and I will unmute you and you can ask it uh, in person. Uh, looks like Mark. That's more of a comment than a question. A drone making a spinal tap reference. Nader will explode just after his presentation. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, and I am a drummer, so I'll, I'll doubly explode. I'll just leave a green globule on the seat. I think if, you, if people have questions, go ahead and type them in and Nader can answer them during the next talk. We probably should move on. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay, let's move on. Our last speaker is uh, Stefan Fuglistaller. He's an associate professor of geoscience at Princeton University. And uh, take it away, Stefan. Okay, thank you very much. Can you see my screen? 
Yeah, it looks good. Okay, can you see my cursor? Yep, yes. that, that looks good too. Okay, wonderful. So thank you very much for the invitation to give the talk here. Um, I will be talking about clouds, uh, not so much directly about climate sensitivity, but obviously clouds do have an important role for climate sensitivity. I would like to start with um, a little slide here, which I find an interesting question. It's sort of this uh, symbolized equation here it shows you a hurricane, a desert, and if you average all up, which is what Tsuki Manabi has done ages ago, you got a global mean temperature profile. And you can discuss actually a lot about the global climate and the climate sensitivity just from a one dimensional perspective, which suggests a high degree of linearity in the climate system, which seems to be at odds with the fact that probably every textbook and paper emphasizes non linearities in the system. Also, we have this uh, canonical equation here that sort of argues that the <clears throat> response at the top of the atmosphere would be something that is linear to the global average temperature, which again, if you think about it, seems to be remarkable. Now, I'd like to kind of start with my, uh, my talk with a recent paper that Yi Shang, our graduate student in AOS, uh, together with Nader and I, uh, published that argues kind of it is actually not a coincidence that you can write this equation at least for clear sky. So first comes the complex, complexi complexity of the problem, if you sort of do a local linear regression of top of atmosphere fluxes, the outgoing long wave radiation at clear sky relative to the surface temperature change, you get a quite a variety of responses. Among them, you even have regions where OLR goes down as surface temperature goes up. This has also been called the super greenhouse effect and seems to defeat the equation that I have here on the upper left, right? So if that temperature goes up, you basically expect uh, OLR to go up. Okay, turns out this is the wrong way to look or think about the problem. If you look in the global average, this is um, the panel here. Each color is one model in CMIP6. It's simply the outgoing long wave radiation is almost perfect linear function of the global average surface temperature. And building on excellent work by uh, Daniel Cole and Kim Cronin, which show that if you have sort of approximately a moist area about that under approximately relative constant, um, rel constant relative humidity, the outgoing long wave radiation is indeed a linear function of surface temperature. If you generalize that and ask under what conditions is that true for a global mean, what you find out is that it has to be that the free tropospheric PDF of relative humidity has to be invariant. And this is what is shown on the right. Um, sort of this panel here shows simply the time evolution and the fact that you have here two lines which you can't distinguish simply means the PDF for free tropospheric relative humidity does not change significantly under global warming and correspondingly each model has this linear res uh, response to surface temperature. Thus the point of super greenhouse effect and other things is basically is simply an artifact of thinking in geographic space things move around and you see all sorts of odd effects. With that, so clear sky is linear, but what we end up with is clouds. Clouds disturb the linearity. And I have here simply data from um, um, runs that have been done at GFDL with AM4, AMIP simulations. And this is the same result as has been pointed out many times before. If you use observed SSTs as lower bounded condition, what you actually found out is that the short wave cloud radiative effect is neither monotonic nor an exact function of surface temperature. So what I have here, the black dots are sort of up to about 1979. You sort of have generally a decrease in the short wave radiative effect. And then from about 79 onwards, you have an increase. So an increased reflection of short wave radiation. I would like to talk about that more from an observational perspective. So this is a model result. This has also been termed the so-called pattern effect. And the reason is straightforward, right? If you have at constant value of surface temperature, you have different states of short wave radiative effect, then it must be something to do with the distribution of temperature. And so the term pattern effect seems to be quite compelling. But I would like to argue, however, you should not think of this type of pattern that it matters where you have black, white or whatever, but there is something else you should 
probably think more of two modes. And the main difference is that it doesn't matter where the warm or the cold is, but the question is how much warmer is the warmest relative to the average? To make that case, I'm looking at observation. As I said, model is one thing, but you would like to know is reality, does that show something like that? The upper panel here is from a paper I published last year. It's simply the blue line is the average SST in the tropics, and the orange line is the average tropical atmospheric temperature. You see the two are highly correlated, but there are departures from it. So in other words, if you want to write the function of, of um, sorry, the pre-tropospheric or just general tropospheric temperature as a function of SST, you cannot do that perfectly. So what I do is the following, it's a straightforward operation. I take the tropical average boundary layer temperature and the regress the temperature at each level in the tropics against the average boundary layer temperature. If you do that, you get approximately a moist idea about. This is known, this is textbook. What you can do now is go to the departure from that scale. And this is what is shown in panel B here. So this doesn't show you anymore whether it's warm or cold. For that, you would have to look at panel A. But what you see is that this is now the profile from 1000 millibars to 200 millibar. And whenever it is red, like here following 2010, it means the troposphere is warm relative to the average boundary layer. And when it is blue, it means the free troposphere is cold relative to the temperature of the boundary layer. And we can envision that with the lowest sketch here is simply the free troposphere need not scale linearly with the average temperature. The free troposphere scales with the conditions that you have in the regions of deep convection, whereas the boundary layer temperature is in direct contact with the surface and therefore scales linearly with the average temperature. Is that relevant? Yes, it is. But let's first look how it is connecting to the actual SSTs, because the hypothesis was that whenever the free troposphere is warm, the deep convective regions should be anomalously warm. To make that case, I again take the SSTs, but I bin them. So I'm simply sorting them from cold to warm and then aggregate them in percentiles. This is what is shown on the y-axis here. So on the upper part here, this is the warmest SSTs, and at the low part, this is the cold end of tropical SSTs. You can do the same thing as you always do with data. You can deseasonalize it, and you can take out the mean of every month. And then you get this pattern here. And what this shows is when the upper part here is blue, it means that relative to the standard or base distribution from cold to warm, the warm regions are now anomalously cold, whereas the cold regions, by definition, have to be anomalously warm. So this would correspond to a state where you have less discrepancy between warmest and coldest. And you immediately see that this corresponds to the state when the free troposphere is anomalously cold. Conversely, immediately see that when the warmest waters where you have most deep convection are anomalously warm relative to the average, so is the free troposphere is anomalously warm relative to the boundary layer. We can take a simple metric thereof. You can sort of think of different ways to define that. I have taken just a very simple approach. I call that SST sharp. If you have a better name, please use that. Um, I simply take the top 30% of the SST distribution and I average the anomaly in that range here. So that is simply a metric. Whenever it's SST sharp is positive, it means the warmest water are anomalously warm. Whenever SST sharp is negative, it means the warmest waters are anomalously cold. That actually explains more or less the entire tropical shortwave CRE variations that we can see in series EBAF. Let me briefly explain what this plot shows. The upper panel, the black line, is simply the time series 
of series EPAP shortwave CRE as reported in the version 4.1 data product. The green line is what you get when you do a linear regression against average SST. So you see, it's not too bad. Um, you get an R of about 0.61. But when you add this SFT sharp, you get the blue line and you see that a lot of the shape of the curve is now much better explained. And the uh, regression coefficient goes to about 0.8. Or if you do sort of invariance, each of these predictors explains about roughly the same amount of variance. The lower panel here simply shows the two predictors. The solid line is the average SST, what it does for shortwave CRE, and the dotted line is what SST sharp is doing for <coughs> the um, clouds here. And so the point is that if you straightforward, right, um, Klein and Hartman had a paper, a seminal paper in the 1990s. The point is simply when you have a stronger inversion at the boundary layer, low clouds. Um, are more uh, frequent, and therefore you have a higher shortwave CRE. Whereas if the inversion strength is weaker, you would have less um, low clouds. And relatively straightforward mechanism, uh, nature actually shows us variations therein. So that helps us a lot. For example, we can much better understand what happens during El Nino. This is an El Nino um, from December 2015, it's simply the local anomalies. And anyone who wants to come forward and make a bet, whether this is now on average positive or negative, please do so. The point is simply you have positive, you have negative, you have no clue from looking at the map whether that is should be positive or negative on average. However, when we look in the stratification picture with S T sharp, everything becomes very uh, clear. So what I have here is the 1998 El Nino, and please just look here. This is again the tropical average temperature profile as it evolves over the 1998 El Nino. So the troposphere warms, the boundary layer warms. If I subtract the expected warming with the boundary layer, I get this picture here. And so what you see here is simply that in the initial stage of El Nino, the tropical free troposphere is actually cold relative to the boundary layer and vice versa in the second stage of the El Nino. Now the free troposphere is anomalously warm. We immediately find the corresponding picture in the SSTs, which is again the percentile. So the point is relatively straightforward. In the initial phase of El Nino, the coldest water warm up initially, not the warmest waters. Therefore, your spread is decreasing. Only in the second phase of El Nino, when El Nino is already decaying, the warmest waters also warm up, and then the free troposphere picks up that signal. So that, for example, shows you that you can have within El Nino or a La Nina, this SST sharp changes sign. And this explains why you have a lot of scatter, and you cannot use um, El Nino as an excellent uh, predictor for what clouds do under global warming, because you can have the same Nino 3.4 or any other index value, but you can have different cloud radiative effects. With that, I conclude the cheeky version. Evenness or the variance is really important in the climate system. As Karl Marx already would have said, an even world is a warm world, and the point is simply the more even it is, the less inversion you have and the less clouds you have. And work from uh, that I'm doing with uh, Levi Silvers, a paper in progress, is since the 1980s, according to observed SSTs, um, the unevenness is increasing and the world has become, yeah, chilling. Okay, so 2019 paper explains kind of the, um, the, uh, the, the, this cloud effect as observed. Um, there's a paper with Levi Silvers on what happens during the historical period and on the impact of what that means for the next 10 years. I will publish in 2030. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, that was uh, very interesting. Um, so, any questions uh, for Stefan? I guess I will make more of a comment than a question. Uh, organizers privilege. Even the, the modeling community that calls it a pattern effect, um, 
I think has touched on this issue of warm pool temperatures versus other temperatures. In Yue's paper, Yue Dong's paper on Green's functions, she proposes a similar index of the ratio of warm pool temperatures to global average surface temperatures uh, as able to explain uh, the, the change in the short wave cloud feedback, including the, um, um, the AMIP results. Yes, absolutely. Um, you know, so, so the point is, is really what we've already um, a couple of years back emphasized is temperature trends is the, the physics is not the Western warm pool per se, right? This is a, a continental configuration that we have at present. And this is, what we simply stress here is that you should think of the warm regions per se, or the deep convective regions per se, and not so much patterns. So you know, kind of one of the, the issues obviously is if you go with geography and then you have change of patterns, your, your index can fall flat. Right? So you're not going to, if you would go towards an, an El Nino world or so, and you define your index as the you know, longitude latitude of Western Pacific, that would not work. So the point is simply, it comes out all very clear if you sort of go away from geography and you just sort of look into these spins because as I said, in geography, whether it works or not is, is sometimes a little bit luck. And as evidence, look at this um, pattern of plus and minus of shortwave radiative feedback, right? And so that there are limits, it, 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 you know, these distortions cannot be too large, else your index falls flat. Yes. So the point Good is really, point. You know, the, the, the question is, and, and that is a question, and I, I formulated that, that, right? It could be also the pattern if you shift clouds in latitude, right? the, the, the correlation with the incoming solar radiation would also have a big impact. And so the argument here is simply that what I can see is this, this basically thermal effect. So it's not shifting in latitude or, I don't know, moving clouds from the ocean over land where you have a different surface reflectivity. You know, these all would also matter, right? And there I, I would tend to think more of sort of pattern in the sense, yeah, it depends on where you place things. And the argument here is, it's not so much the where you place things, but it's the mean stratification that is key. And that controls the integral. Right. It's about what controls the future atmospheric temperature. Okay, so Jonah has a question. Uh, interesting talk, Stefan. Variations in SST sharp should also affect the long wave clear sky feedback since a warmer free troposphere should radiate more. Do you find any evidence for a connection? Um, we looked into that and I think there's also um, a paper by Sandrine Bonney coming out. Um, they argue that they see, but they didn't look exactly at SST sharp, but they sort of address similar questions. I must say, I have not, you know, kind of based on, on the work with Nader, um, there's obviously, and the paper that Yi has just published, there's obviously a big interest. I have not seen a very, very strong effect. So my, my, my main focus has been really on clouds um, as, as, as the dominant um, response that basically behaves in unexpected ways. Okay, where you can see the signal very, very clearly. I can make a comment on Jonah's question. I think some of the work that UA did and then Chen showed at CFMIP shows that you see similar, you see a similar um, pattern in the net long wave water vapor feedback of the role of the warmest SSTs. Yeah, I, I'm not arguing against that. What I'm saying is in, in quantitative um, numbers in, in the series EBAF, it's the short wave radiative feedback that responds. Cool. Um, are there any, does anyone else have a question for um, Stefan or for uh, any of our speakers? I think some of them have already been answered. Let me skim the chat very quickly. I guess there was an earlier question by Steve Klein for Nader. What is a WVP naught in the equation? Is that a function of temperature? 
Yeah, that's a good question. Um, and I think it's related to Jonah's question. Um, it's not a function of surface temperature. Um, it's, uh, it, there's sort of an average tropospheric temperature in there that's not very sensitive to surface temperature. And there's um, relative, relative humidity, lapse rate, uh, and some fundamental constants. Um, and so what that means then is that in that equation, there's a very muted um, sensitivity to surface temperature change. Um, I mean, the equation is approximate. Um, and so there's details in it that you can, uh, that you can quibble with. Um, but I think the, the sensitivity of that T kink, T kink equation that I showed uh, is consistent with, um, with anvil temperatures um, not varying strongly with surface temperature. Okay, thank you. Uh, let's see. There's, um, okay, there's two more questions. I'm not sure who this is for. Can we artificially create more clouds to increase this effect and the associated cooling? I think this is for Angie. Um, well, I think that this was, uh, might have been in another talk, a little bit after his talk, but um, I, I guess, um, I mean, you know, there are these uh, geoengineering experiments where people try to add um, CCN to change the number of low clouds. Um, I feel like the um, degree of, of the amount of clouds you need to change to have an effect would be really, really, really large. So I, um, I wouldn't be too optimistic about that, uh, but I haven't really thought about it in great detail. So perhaps we shouldn't totally write it off. I don't know what do other people think about geoengineering via affecting low clouds? I don't know. That's probably a question for an entire seminar for an entire <laughs> hour by itself. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, I think people have thought of marine cloud brightening definitely. Yeah, yeah. I'm not an expert. I don't know if anybody else wants to comment on that. Um, if not, can move on to what I think is the last unanswered question for Nader uh, by Shang Lei. Uh, monochromatic simulation usually takes at 10 to the minus three to 10 to the minus four uh, inverse centimeters, aiming to resolve half width of Doppler broadening. 0.1 inverse centimeter is at the coarse end of half widths of pressure broadening in the troposphere. It might be interesting to see what kind of K kink and PDF looks like at monochromatic or nearly monochromatic resolution. It has been documented before the distributions of line intensity and line spacing in water vapor bands are different from those in CO2 bands, more randomly distributed. I guess this can affect your modeling of K kink. Yeah, so that's a good point um, that uh, that PDF that I showed um, is going to be sensitive to the spectral resolution at which you run your model. Um, and uh, and John Lee is pointing out that, um, you know, it's uh, that the PDF is um, it's at a reasonable resolution, but not necessarily, you know, uh, perfectly converged um, and people do run line by line codes at higher resolutions. Um, I guess I wouldn't expect the results to uh, change a lot. I mean, it's worth doing. Um, so that was one reason why I showed that, um, that coarse, the coarse grained absorption coefficients, which also seem to peak, uh, at around the same, um, value. Um, so that's, that suggests that there's some robustness to this, um, but it would be a good follow-up uh, calculation to do. Thank you. Cool. Uh, okay. we got one more question. How does the increased water absorption at higher air temperature affect these clouds? I think for every one degree Celsius increase in average air temperature can hold 7% more water vapor before precipitating. Um, I guess that's for me. So, um, I mean, indeed, Clausius Clapron tells us that uh, the air can hold 7% roughly more water vapor. 
uh, in response to warming. And we know that there's a approximately constant relative humidity uh, warming. So the water vapor that we see in model projections and in observations does go up that much. Um, but this, uh, the, this talk about the atmospheric energy constraints is kind of um, shows that the increase in global mean precipitation uh, is, is a lot less than that increase in water vapor. So uh, I guess this is a, uh, it's a whole topic in and of itself, but I think that my favorite paper on this would be um, by uh, Bill Ingram. I think it was in 2011, and I think it was a single author paper where he um, lays out some of the effects of water vapor specifically on atmosphere graded cooling. Um, and so I think that's a pretty direct answer to this question, but it's, um, I, I don't have it on the tip of my tongue exactly what all of the details are. So I would refer you to that paper. Okay. Well, thanks everybody. I think this is um, a good time to stop. Um, I wanna thank all the speakers. Thank all of you for showing up. And we're still looking for um, volunteers for the next uh, seminars. Yep. <clears throat> Have a good day, everyone. Wear your mask. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Take care.